James R. Ben, welcome to Suit Up the Podcast. Terrence, thanks for inviting me to be on. This is great. Hey, it's awesome. I've been enjoying following you on Instagram and threads, and you are a voracious reader, and you've written some amazing books. So really, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Would you mind sharing just a brief biographical sketch with the audience? No, not at all. Um, I started my career in libraries uh, because um, I wanted to be associated with the world of literature, but mm -hmm. also because when I was working at the University of Denver, I was working on, a, on the mail route. And in the winter in Denver, carrying canvas sacks of mail uh, is pretty tough. And one of my stops was at the library. And I would come in coated in ice, bringing these bags of uh, mail in full of books and magazines. And it was always break time. And the librarians would be in the back room having coffee and, and hot chocolate. And I said, hmm. Uh, this looks a little better to me than carrying mail. So I started at the University of Denver, a library graduate program, uh, and went on from there. Um, and I've had sort of bounced around in different library jobs over the years and um, finally uh, got the gumption to see if I could actually write something, which I had always wanted to do. I worked in one of my growing up jobs was I worked briefly in a library. So uh, that actually gives me a follow-up question here. Do you organize books based on the Dewey Decimal System in your head? You know what? I started to do that, um, and then it just became a little overwhelming. So now I do it by general subject area, so uh, it, it's more a personal system, but they are organized, definitely. Mm -hmm. hey. And they all come out to the edge of the shelf. None of this pushing back and putting doodads in front of the books. The books are primary. Yes. And I'm just going to, since you can see the back of my shelf where I do yeah. have dads on them, mm -hmm. I will just tell you that's due to my fiance having put stuff on shelves. I do not claim. It's, all... <laughs> it's always the case. Don't take responsibility for that. So <laughs> the Billy Boyle mystery series mm -hmm. has been your flagship writing project. How did that start? Well, it actually, it's a long, goes back a long way. It started in 1972 when I went to the movies. Uh, it was opening day for The Godfather, and I'm mad about gangster films, so I made it a point to go the first day. And I still remember sitting in the theater, watching the opening, which is the garden party scene, if, mm -hmm. if you remember that. So it's August, 1945, war has just ended, um, and nobody is in uniform except Michael Corleone, who's sort of the white sheep of the family. And what struck me right away was that in any other situation, a decorated Marine Corps captain would have been the center of attention. But if you watch that scene, people are passing him by, sort of bumping him on the shoulder, like he doesn't even matter. And that dichotomy struck me. It was really interesting. What was it about this family that, uh, that caused them to look away from uh, the uh, the, the nation and focus on the family and their family business and what was it like for Michael and then I started thinking well wow what if Sonny had gone into the Marines what, what would that have been like so that just struck me and then I literally did nothing about it except remember it for 30 years mm -hmm. and when it finally uh, came time to see if I could write a book um, I went back to that notion and just transferred it uh, from the Italian mafia to the Boston Irish, uh, mm -hmm. from criminals to police, and try to uh, delve into that same dynamic of a family that uh, has their own loyalties, uh, in this case, uh, to United Ireland, to the Boston Police Department, to each other, um, and not so much for what they see as another war to save the British Empire. Um, so really, uh, I have to thank uh, Francis Ford Coppola for the inspiration. You know, I wonder if we were to look at like the um, the idea trails, mm -hmm. how many different great things have been spawned from films like The Godfather, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. it just takes that little idea and twirls off. Right. One of the things I think you, it's so well written to have Billy Boyle's family as that Irish Boston, mm -hmm. because it it's one of those things that fits really well in the world. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember what book it was I was reading, but 
And it was a book on writing that was basically like the thing that you should be doing when you're creating characters and stories is you want this particular character could only exist at this particular time and maximizing their world to the story. Mm -hmm. And something you've done an amazing job over 18 going on 19 books mm -hmm. is Billy Boyle exists as this Boston Irish cop doing a lot of things in Europe where Irish, Ireland, Boston mm -hmm. has this very distinct flavor yeah, that yeah. at other points in times in history wouldn't necessarily feel as um inner conflict just is right there on the surface mm -hmm. depending on where he's at and who he's interacting with because a lot of them are british europeans right, right. And now i'm i was born in new york city i'm a yankees fan but somehow boston just felt right and the boston mm -hmm. irish just felt like the perfect situation it could have been uh, anywhere else, but you know, there's something about that um, that snappy Boston attitude, and uh, combined with the uh, the Irish radicalism that that uh, propelled him into the story. Mm -hmm. Well, I've started listening to the audiobook versions mm -hmm. of the books, mm -hmm. and Mark Viter, I believe, is his the name of the narrator, um, and he just does such a great job of nailing Billy's voice. Yes, yeah, and subsequently, um, Peter Burkrot. Uh, Sorry, over. Peter Burkrot is the one I'm thinking yeah, of. Yeah, Mark did the first two or three or something like that. And Peter, Peter's an actor. And mm -hmm. when he reads, he is acting the voices. Uh, so uh, I, I'm mesmerized by the story when he does it. Mm -hmm. it it's, what does it feel like hearing your characters' voices like that? You know, it's the strangest thing because sometimes I'll need to look something up in a book five or six books ago. And I flip through the page and when did I write this? But this isn't bad. <laughs> and it, it, I, I think in writing a book a year, you tend mm -hmm. to not have enough room to store all that information. And going back, it's, it's interesting to see what, um, uh, how, the story, how I structured the story and how I brought uh, the dialogue to bear. And that's something that comes alive when you listen more than, than when you read. So uh, it's a lot of fun. And sometimes I'm just, wow. That, that wasn't bad. <laughs> so at this point, the Billy Boyle series is nearly 20 years long. You've published the mm -hmm. first one in 2006. Yeah. Do you have like a, I know like in long running television shows, they do a series Bible mm -hmm. to like keep track of the character's mm -hmm. details. Do you have anything like that to try keeping track of your ensemble of characters? Uh, no, uh, that would be too organized. But I, I do often go back. Uh, so in the book I just submitted for next year, just sent that into Soho Press. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I brought back um, a character from the early books. Uh, and, and of course, I can't. He was a, a British uh, naval officer. Um, and I had to go back and, and figure out what was their last interaction, because he, I, think, I think he faded away in the, uh, in the after the third book. But he had a he, he would have filled the role, so I brought him back. Um, and I, I did have to go through and and because there was some uh, conflict with Billy, um, mm -hmm. and I had to fit that into the this story. Um, so it's handy to have the books on the shelf, uh, the books on my computer, and go back and search because there's oh, yeah. a lot of uh, there's a lot of characters, uh, mm -hmm. and part of that is you know keeping a series fresh. Mm -hmm. uh, can be tough, especially when the setting has to be the same. And it's World mm -hmm. War II. You know, we, we we can't go too far afield from that. So I try to modulate the supporting cast of characters so I don't have too much of any one in in each book. Um, so that's one thing that I do go back and trace. So when did we last have Diana have a major role? Or mm -hmm. Big Mike, you know, be on screen for a good part of the book, um, and that helps in in uh, modulating um, uh, some difference into each story, so different voices and that sort of thing. Well, and you do such a great job. So I have just sampled through. I haven't read that beginning to end yet, mm -hmm. but I've generally picked through and gone. Okay, I started roughly somewhere in the middle, and I've read a few books prior and the books mm -hmm. ahead. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that makes a good mystery series mm -hmm. is that while there is continuity mm -hmm. that I can appreciate when I'm reading through like four books in a row, mm -hmm. 
the reality is this is a series you could literally pick up any volume and get a very good mystery and feel like you know who the characters are even when there's depth of backstory to all of them you know i'm always relieved when in a review somebody says you you know it was easy this was this was book 11 it was the first one i read and it was easy to get into because uh, that's one thing i really sweat is I, i don't want a reader to say well this who are these people? This makes no sense. Um, so, yeah, it's that's a challenge. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is book titles, because mm-hmm. you have stellar book titles like Proud Sorrows, mm-hmm. uh, a couple of other favorites I picked out, When Hell Struck Twelve, Immortal Terror, yeah. Blue Madonna. How do you come up with the titles for these books? I, I work hard at it because I... I I like to have the title before I even start writing. And it has to have something to do with the theme of the book. It has to reach into the story because Mm -hmm. some titles are, you know, it it really doesn't matter what it is. It's, you know, Mm -hmm. if it's a thriller, it's, you know, 10 seconds to death or something. But (laughs) um, uh, I just start looking into quotes from uh, famous people, from poets, from politicians who have some relation to the book. Um, and all of a sudden I'll find it and I go, that's it. That that tells part of the story. And Proud Sorrows does it because, well, that, that's uh, it's related to the story. But I have to tell you about when Hell Struck 12. Please. So I, I, found, I found that title in a poem. I don't have the book in front of me. Um, and I just thought, wow, when Hell Struck 12, that is... Man, that is great. That's the title. So write the book, send it in. It's about to be published. And somehow I stumbled upon another version of the poem. And it said, when the bell struck 12, which doesn't have the same no. oomph to it. So I went back to the uh, site where I found when hell struck 12. And I'm looking at it. And I looked down at my keyboard and the B and the H are one above the other. And it really was when the bell struck 12. But I thought, well, no, when hell struck 12 is so much better, I'm, I'm sticking with the typo. So that's <laughs> because it, it's a great line. It yeah, is. Yeah, but... Like it, it just has such resonance. And mm-hmm. that's like I just said, it's one of the things that stands out with your books. Mm-hmm. Because I do feel like a lot of thrillers just kind of have this. Um a, the covers are generic, which is another thing I think that your series does an amazing job. And even the books that aren't a part of the Billy Boyle series, you do an amazing job of having these incredible covers designed. Yeah. And, and that's really all due to Soho. When I first started, um, actually the first book, Billy Boyle, I did have a different title. Uh, there's a poem, an old Norse poem at the beginning of it called A Strand of Corpses. Ooh. And I thought that was kind of eerie and cool and I sent that in, and my editor, uh, Laura Huska, who was the founder of the company, uh, said, that's too literary. No, you know, people don't understand what a strand is. And we actually, it's the only time I ever had an argument with somebody at Soho. And we went back and forth, this was over the telephone, because um, Laura's kind of old-fashioned. Um, and, and finally, she said, well, why don't we just call it Billy Boyle? I said, fine. And it was like a stroke of genius, unintended genius. It introduces the character. Wow, mm-hmm. you know, how smart. Uh, but I still have the poem in there, A Strand of Corpses. So uh, I like that one. Uh, I'm a big fan of James Bond, Ian Fleming, as you can tell, poster mm-hmm. of me doing my Bond pose. <laughs> and that's one of the things that I think Fleming did a great job at is his titles do just give you the, either it's an intriguing enough idea mm-hmm. Yeah. Or it tells you just simply, this is like the name of the big bad in the story. Right. Yeah. A character name for a title, I think, is underrated oftentimes mm-hmm. when the character has enough character, as it yeah. were. Yeah. I mean, and when you have an alliterative, why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Billy uh, Boyle from Boston. Billy Boyle from Boston. <laughs> and that is a terrible Boston accent. Please forgive me, <laughs> everyone from Boston that listens to this show. Uh, recently, speaking of Ian Fleming, I saw you had posted a picture of reading Nicholas Shakespeare's Ian Fleming, The Com- Complete Man. Yeah. I read that earlier this year. I was just curious, what did you get out of the book? Was there anything that surprised you? Are you a big James Bond or Ian Fleming fan? Um, well, 
I thought I was a James Bond fan because I really only remember the movies. I know I read some of the books in high school, um, but reading his autobiography, no, his biography, um, it's astounding how much of that came out of the Second World War mm -hmm. and how dried up he felt when he exhausted uh, all the experiences that, that he could draw on. And he was somewhat of a fantasist, a, a Casino Royale. Uh -huh. uh, according to Fleming, uh, he had the idea, actually when he was on duty as Ian Fleming, of taking these German agents at, at the casino for all their money. His boss, Adam McGodfrey, in his unpublished memoir, says, no, they were Hungarians, and he lost all his money. But <laughs> he still had the ability to take that notion and, mm -hmm. and build a whole book around it. So, so that's absolutely great. Um, and I picked up that book because several people had recommended it, but I'm also, I'm starting, uh, see, this is a very schizophrenic time of year for me because mm -hmm. I'm talking to you about the book that's coming out. <laughs> I've just sent in the one for next year and I'm starting the one for after that. So I should say the one that's coming out. Phantom, Phantom Patrol. Patrol. Uh, Again, <laughs> stellar cover. Just, <laughs> it looks amazing. <laughs> But uh, Ian Fleming is going to be uh, in uh, the book for 2026, uh, which is called The Ninth Circle from Ooh. Dante. Um, and it, it takes place in Cuba. Uh, and oh. I thought we need to go somewhere different. So uh, Billy and Kaz are seconded to uh, British naval intelligence to investigate the death of an agent in Cuba. Uh, so they're going to enjoy some rum and sunshine and murder. And Ian Fleming will be involved because he was in naval intelligence. That's awesome. And, that... and I've already had fun writing a scene where uh, Kaz, Billy's good friend, very well-dressed uh, Polish gentleman, is wearing his linen suit and decides to, uh, instead of his Webley revolver, big heavy British revolver, he picks up a, a Walther PPK because uh, it doesn't ruin the line of his suit. And Ian Fleming says, oh, what, what, what's that? Uh, and Kaz shows it to him. So Kaz will be the one who gives him the idea for, for one of Bond's uh, weapons. That is such a lovely <laughs> flourish. Uh, two things. First, one of the things that I really appreciate about the World War II aesthetic and time mm -hmm. is that you really can tell a multitude of different kinds of stories. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. There are war, you can do just straight up war fiction, or like in this, there are a couple of your books that have very much of an espionage mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. And then there's just straight up cop drama. Yeah. And the fact that you're able to weave all of those different elements together in these stories is both genre wise incredible. Mm -hmm. um, but then also it just provides, like you said, keeping the series fresh. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It really, because this was one of the things I thought of when I was reading the biography on mm -hmm. Fleming is that really that World War II time gave birth to so much of our great fiction because mm -hmm. it had that full pantheon of different mm -hmm. concepts and ideas and things yeah. going on in it. And you've done an amazing job of being able to mm -hmm. extract and weave your characters through those stories. Yeah, it, it is a little bit like uh, Fleming's approach, except he was doing it from his actual experience, but mm -hmm. it's to draw something out that's intriguing uh, and and might, uh, you know, rub up against the common uh, conception of what mm -hmm. the war was like in the greatest mm -hmm. generation and all that. So I, I like a, a, an idea that puts grit in the wheels of history and mm -hmm. gives you something for the character uh, to chew on and, and to have to overcome. Well, and that's one hey, of the things... I, yeah, go ahead. I, just, I, I held this up, but I just want to tell you an interesting story about the cover. I, Please. I, I interrupted myself before <laughs> in, uh, saying that uh, Soho Press is responsible for these covers and uh, they have an artist that they've contracted for, for all of them. But this, this takes place during most of it, during the opening days of the Battle of the Bulge. And this is taken from an actual photograph. Uh, a, a GI had a camera and they were not supposed to have cameras because mm -hmm. they didn't want the enemy... Uh, Finding pictures that could, uh, you know, uh, in Leak. danger. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But what this guy did is he rigged up a camera under his coat so he could just open it and click it 
whenever he wanted. And there's a really uh, an eerie picture of a soldier emerging from the snow, from the trees, and with a wary look in his eyes, looking back and forth. Um, and at first I thought it was a staged picture, but it's mm. real. It's, it's you know, it's somebody candid. really coming out of the woods and having that, that haunted, fearful, uh, super aware uh, look in his eyes. And um, when I sent that to, to the artist, because they, they asked me to you know, come up with some mm -hmm. ideas, um, he turned it into that picture, which I think is just just perfect for this series. So um, anyway, the, the, the credit doesn't go to me. The credit really goes to Soho Press uh, and Daniel Cosgrove. Uh, mm -hmm. is the artist. And if you uh, Google Daniel, uh, he's got a website that has all his artwork, including some of these uh, covers, and it's fascinating stuff. He's based in Chicago, I think, if I remember yes. right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, stuff like that stands out to me because I'm from the Midwest. And uh -huh. anytime I see Chicago, I'm like, oh, yes, <laughs> Midwest representation. <laughs> um, I heard in a previous interview that for From the Shadows, the inspiration for that cover was Rembrandt's uh, Sea of Galilee. Yes, yeah. I just, I think that's so cool. And that was, was from the uh, the theft up to the Boston Museum, Isabel Gardner Museum. It was one of the paintings that was stolen. And I was watching uh, a really good documentary called This is a Robbery. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all about that. Uh, uh, and they haven't recovered it to this day. But when I saw that picture and I had previously watched the Guns of Navarone mm -hmm. for, again um, for inspiration, and because mm -hmm. it's the beginning of the book opens in a similar circumstance. Uh, and when I saw that boat, I thought, "Well, okay, you know, go, going through the storm on the Sea of Galilee must have been just as bad as as Billy's storm." So we'll use that. Well, and I think that that's part of what makes these stories really click is that it has such resonance between uh, the cover, the title, and the story. Mm -hmm. unfortunately very often today the titles are generic the covers are generic mm -hmm. and even if the story is unique it isn't people won't pick up on that as quickly because it's just being packaged the same way everything else is right well we will never have a woman in a red coat running away on, on the <laughs> of a book. <laughs> and it's part of a brand. I think one thing mm -hmm. that Soho does very well is branding their books as, as crime fiction or literary mm -hmm. fiction. Uh, you know, they do with their paperbacks. Each mm -hmm. author has their own color code and the, yes. uh, the, the, the books are set up uh, the mm -hmm. same. Uh, but it's the cover art is is different for each author. Uh, so when you walk into a bookstore, the idea is you just go, oh, that's a Soho book. That's got to be good. So they're they're expert at that. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things I uh, I have somewhere in my pile of books mm -hmm. is One Shot Harry by Gary Phillips. Oh yeah, uh, and yeah. that's a Soho book, and yeah. they just did such a great job with the cover. Just mm -hmm. again, when the full thing is a piece of art, mm -hmm. it really is the type of thing that you want to have yeah. sitting on your shelf yeah. instead of simply. It, this is what makes books feel irreplaceable at times. Instead mm -hmm. of like yeah. I get. E-readers are wonderful, mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, I like that physical book. Right, and you have it there on your shelf as a memory of what you read. You can point it out to somebody. It's it's a whole yeah. I mean, I like my Kindle. You know, it's great mm -hmm. for reading at night. Um, great for travel. Yeah, yeah, yeah perfect. Uh, I want to ask you about the cameos because you do such a great job of having these little cameos of characters that mm -hmm. are either extended or just truncated my mm. favorite was sterling hayden just showing oh, yeah, up yeah, in a story yeah. do mm. you have a favorite historical cameo that you've been able to either lightly or more heavily use in a plot actually talking about sterling hayden he almost ran away with the story i mean i really <laughs> had to shut him up <laughs> take him off screen because he was so fascinating and that just happened again so the the book I turned in for next year, the title is Down a River. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, um, no, I'm sorry. See, I'm, I, I'm getting confused. It's in this book. <laughs> it's the three books at a time. Three books at a time. Yeah. Doing a great job. So, uh, in this book, we have two cameos. One is J.D. Salinger, who Ooh. was actually a, a counterintelligence corps officer, uh, non-commissioned officer mm -hmm. uh, in France, was at 
in the Battle of the Bulge was, was right there at the right time. So I thought, how can I not have him then? Mm -hmm. Now, Salinger, of course, is a writer. He was very obedient. He obeyed himself. He, he got his lines. He did his thing. He came and went. Then I found out that David Niven had been an intelligence officer. Um, he was the phantom part of this. I won't go into, but mm -hmm. he was heavily involved in British Army intelligence. Um, so how can you not have David Niven? Well, that guy would not leave. He just, I mean, he was so fascinating that, I mean, I really had to work. He's, he's in about um, the middle third or more, mm -hmm. or middle two thirds of the book. Um, and he just, it was so much fun to write uh, because he left a pretty good record uh, mm -hmm. in his two uh, memoirs of what his wartime service was like. Although he, he famously uh, played it down uh, and um, there's a quote from him about saying uh, that a fam family once asked him to go to their son's grave near Bastogne. Uh, and he went there and there were like 20,000 graves. And he said to himself, this, Nevin, this is 20,000 reasons why you should just shut up about the war, mm -hmm. what you did. Mm -hmm. um, so he's also a great storyteller in spite of that. Um, and there's some great lines that uh, I just lifted right from his memoir and, and had him say. So um, he, he was a lot of fun to write. And I think he's my number one fun cameo. Um, mm -hmm. And then there was Jack Kennedy, which was much more serious. Uh, but uh, right now, I, I've got uh, David Niven on the brain. So uh, we'll have to see how uh, Ian Fleming stacks up against them, because they knew each other. That's right. Again, and Fleming considered Niven for uh, James Bond. Mm -hmm. There's such an interesting, like, um, I one of the interviews, again, just doing prep for this, you had made a comment that mm -hmm. one of the things that's unique about World War II is that it's one of the last times we have a non-professional army in a lot of mm -hmm. cases these were people that had lives back home that they mm -hmm. wanted to get back to mm -hmm. yeah. war was not their profession by and large yeah. and when you see people like ian fleming or um specifically like david niven i'm also thinking of christopher lee mm -hmm. these guys yeah, that sure. had or sterling hayden professions that were well known mm -hmm back home that then went to war and came right. back. I mean, Jimmy Stewart, even for goodness sakes. Yeah. And that, Clark Gable. Mm -hmm. the, these are all people that had stuff back home to go to. And mm -hmm. uh, David Niven, I really want to read that uh, autobiography, that memoir now. Uh, what's the title? Uh, the Moons of Balloon is one, and I'm just drawing a blank on the other, but there's two. One is, I forget which one, is more uh, focused on his war service than the other, but they're both fascinating reading. I'll, ha I'll have to add them to my reading list yeah. because, I mean, I don't really like Casino Royale 67, mm -hmm. but Niven is entertaining yeah, right, anytime yeah. he's on screen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What can you tell us about the Phantom Patrol? Well, the Phantom Patrol is uh, starts off with uh, art thefts. And several years, mm -hmm. more than several years ago now, I was fascinated by the Monuments Men. I mm -hmm. thought I had discovered the Monuments Men. And then the book came out, then the movie came out. So I set it aside because I thought it's, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a little overexposed. But now um, what I am looking into is not their exploits in recovering the art, but mm -hmm. what happened to the art once they collected it. Mm -hmm. So all this artwork that they saved, or that they either saved in, from a battle zone or found that the Germans had taken, they were brought back to collecting areas. So we've got all these um, warehouses full of artwork in, in France shortly after liberation. Um, and there was a lot of theft. So it starts off with uh, Billy working with J.D. Salinger uh, and investigating a gang in Paris that's specializing in stolen art. And it turns into um, uh, an investigation of uh, a stay behind German group that's working to, as part of the Battle of the Bulge plans. And Niven comes in because uh, an important witness is a British officer who's at the front. So Niven takes them, and this is just before the Battle of the Bulge opens up to this quiet sector uh, to interview this officer. And they get caught up in the opening salvos of the Battle of the Bulge. And, um, what I wanted to show 
is what it was like for the soldiers because they didn't know this was a big they didn't even know it was called the battle of the bulge that term wasn't even coined till january a whole month later when a oh. journalist came up with it so all they knew is that all hell was breaking loose right around them uh and i wanted to sort of convey that sense of disconnectedness uh what it was like trying to figure out what was happening um and uh have billy also have to solve uh, a crime uh, and get at what the deeper uh, meaning is behind uh, this group of uh, German state behinds. So, mm -hmm. and, and to give David Niven a time on the stage. I'm really looking forward to it. It mm -hmm. sounds amazing. Uh, what I, I love art theft stories mm -hmm. um charles gate confidential by scott von doviak uh he it's a hard case crime book they uh -huh. actually he wrote a story about the um that boston art theft uh -huh. yeah and just little things like that help like you said it keeps the stories fresh mm -hmm. but also just it hits the right buttons for me yeah. and i think that's part of the reason i'm enjoying the billy boyle series mm -hmm. is that it definitely hits my right buttons at the right mm -hmm. time yeah. Yeah. When is the Phantom Patrol publishing? This is going to be released uh, September 3rd in Kindle and audio. Mm -hmm. There was a glitch at the printers, printing the hardcovers. So that release date is September 24th. And I'll just say for anybody listening who's planning on coming to any events in September, the bookstores are, are getting expedited shipments. So oh, good. when I have events in early September, the bookstores will have the hardcovers. Uh, but if you order on Amazon or something, it'll be September 24th. It's nice that you guys are able to make get that to work for the bookstores because you do an amazing job of supporting local bookstores. Mm -hmm. And like I've seen some of your interviews with the Poison Pen Bookshop. Yeah. And I think that that's so cool because we don't have as many of them as we used to. Right, right. And Poison Pen uh, is just a fantastic place. Every night they pack that place with events and it's just amazing i'm adding it to like my bucket list i need to get there i need to see this yeah, place yeah. and the same thing with murder by the book in uh in texas uh so uh in houston uh great tex-mex food and a good bookstore what more does one need really mm -hmm. when one of the things that i meant to mention earlier but we we we're having a great conversation, which means sometimes I forget my notes, but you do a great job giving nuance to World War II. And you had commented a little bit earlier on trying to put a little grit into the story that we typically know. One of the things that I've noticed in a handful of the books is you aren't just painting this as a very black and white war where mm -hmm. Americans are nothing but the best. Mm -hmm. We've saved the world. Mm -hmm. Hoorah. Yeah. You actually call out the things that we didn't do great in, mm -hmm. in the war. What has that, A, what has that been like writing? And B, what's been the feedback on doing that? Because it's not atypical right. for writing historical right. fiction. Right. Um, there was, you know, one of the problems with having this many books, you no, know, I can get the title, I can look, I can cheat. In the book about racism, um, A Blind Goddess, mm -hmm. that's the only... It's the only book I've received hate mail about emails mm. or comments on Facebook uh, because it deals with racial injustice and how the army segregated uh, black soldiers. Uh, and a lot of people who were fans of the series said, I, I don't want to hear this. Why are why do we have to listen to these people? And, and I was just totally taken aback. I thought mm -hmm. I almost thought it, it's almost passe now. You know, yeah. Are we beyond all this? But it. That was a shocker, um, you know, because I've written about a lot of things about the Holocaust, about all, all sorts of uh, black market uh, mm -hmm. cheating and profiteering. Nobody has a problem with that. But boy, if you talk about how we weren't perfect in in, uh, in our racial relations in the 1940s, mm -hmm. um, and that really, it steps on some of those assumptions because that book opens um, in a pub mm -hmm. and it's... Uh, a, a friend of Billy's, uh, a black soldier who he was friends with in Boston, asked for his help. And they meet at this pub and there's shattered glass on the floor. 
and Billy says, what, what's this from? And it's, and this is a true story. It's because of the white soldiers who had been given that town as their leave area mm -hmm. um, uh, were told to, uh, no, the, I'm sorry, I have it backwards. Blacks, a black unit was given that town to, to go into for leave, but the army didn't let blacks and whites go to the same town because they didn't want them to start fights. Uh, so the white soldiers who uh, were coming into that town went into all the pubs with baseball bats and broke all the glasses so they would not have to drink out of the same mug of beer that a black man had drunk from. And that was the 101st Airborne, the greatest generation. Mm. And people don't like having mm. to deal with that. Now, it wasn't everybody, mm -hmm. but they weren't punished. And, mm -hmm. and they did smash up all, all these pubs in this town. Um, so I think people just don't want to have uh, their vision and their heroes tarnished. Um, but tough, that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. mm. And credit to you for telling the history because mm -hmm. it's just as bad to just pretend that we've been perfect all the time yeah. Yeah. when the reality is we've always been flawed. We're working our flaws out and that's progress. Yeah. Yeah. What is your writing process look like when you're working on historical fiction? Obviously, again, you've been writing this series for nearly 20 years. Mm -hmm. Do you still have to do a lot of research ahead of writing a book or does just the fact that you've been in this time period as long as you have, does that just give you a, oh, I know this setting and time? I, you know, I, I have some of that. I have a lot of confidence in my characters. Mm -hmm. So I know how they're going to react. But no, when I'm working on, like for instance, the book I'm starting now set in Cuba, anything I can read about life in Cuba in the 40s, whether it's politics or, or um, the economy or their role in the war, um, I tend to just inundate myself. And uh, the, the best explanation I can give is uh, Hemingway's iceberg theory mm -hmm. that uh, Ernest Hemingway said, the majesty of an iceberg is due to the fact that nine tenths of it is underwater mm -hmm. and you never see it. And that's what research should be like. Um, so I try to fill my brain up with more than I need and put very little of that on the page because it will seep out anyway in, in, a, in a more confident manner than just you know, having a character recite a bunch of facts. Um, so I tend to read heavily in the area, uh, the theme, the setting that I'm um, about to write. Uh, and then I just keep, keep at it while I'm writing. Um, do a lot, of, of course, you know, use the internet, do a lot of uh, instant research as I need it. Um, but uh, yeah, it, there's an immersion factor. And all of a sudden, you know, I take a lot of notes. And all of a sudden, when I find myself not looking at my notebook anymore, I know, I know OK, now I've got it. It's all up here. So as far as a writing routine goes, do you have a writing routine? If so, what does it look like? No. Um, I try to do a little bit of writing first thing in the morning. Uh, and then uh, this time for you know going for a walk, doing some exercise. I live in Florida, so it could be golf or a going for a swim. Uh, and then in the afternoon, I, I tend to hit my stride. Uh, and if I can do a thousand words a day, uh, that's a great day. Um, uh, and part of my routine is uh, my wife helps me a lot with editing uh, mm -hmm. and feedback. And once I complete a chapter that next morning, I read it aloud to her and then we oh. go through it and, and fix what, what needs to be fixed. So it's helpful I mean, for anybody who writes, reading your stuff out loud mm -hmm. and not make believe out loud to yourself, but really, you know, project the voices. Um, it really helps because all of a sudden things that, that don't work well, you can hear it not work well in a way that you can't see it on the page. Um, so usually by the, the time that's done, that each chapter is pretty well set. And um, I move through the story. I usually don't know who, often I don't know who the, the bad guy is. Mm -hmm. um, whoever is the killer or the whatever. Um, and I let that emerge from all the characters and how they react to each other. Uh, so every now and then I'll be about a third way through the book and I'll shout out to my wife, I, I know who did it. 
<laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Especially when the Billy Boyle stories, it's all told from Billy Boyle's internal mm-hmm. monologue. Mm-hmm. And so it really does have to have this conversational tone to it too. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really great that you have that habit of reading in aloud yeah. afterwards. You know, and it's funny because I, ne- I when I first started, I literally didn't intend it to be first person. And I just assumed that I would be writing in the third person. I had mm-hmm. written one previous book, third person. And I sat down and the first, my finger went to I. And I said, whoa. What just happened? I guess I'm writing this in the first person. That's awesome. Uh, So The Phantom Patrol comes out on September 3rd on digital and on September 24th on physical copy, unless you get to the bookstore to be there with James. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Where can people go to learn more about you and your work? Um, You can go to uh, my website. Just Google me. It's uh, www.com jamesrben.com um, or search Billy Boyle you'll find your way there too awesome thank you again for coming on the show Terrence it's been great thank you very much <laughs>